Hey guys, this is John with Gamester81.com and welcome to my newest series. This is called Talking Retro with Joe. I'm here with Joe Cody. He's the owner of the website Atari2600.com. How are you doing, Joe? Uh, very good. Thanks for coming over, John. So, so in this series, we're going to highlight some kind of unique, rare, and kind of retro items, right, Joe? So yes. what do you have for us today? Well, uh, we jump right into some uh, rare Atari items. These would be some rare Atari 5200 prototypes. Okay. I thought it would be interesting to kind of show you what an Atari prototype looks like. These would be game cartridges that were, um, for example, um, this happens to be track and field. Uh, you happen to have A and E. These are games that were programmed at Atari in California. Uh, this would be in about 1983. And they were never released. And so the one that you're holding in this one as well are represent video games that should have been, could have been, but never were. And so in today, uh, it's interesting to have these, and it gives you a chance to see what Atari was working on at the time that they canceled uh, production of the 5200 system. So are these one of a kind games, essentially? It's a difficult question to say. I can, I, when, they, when you're dealing with something that was never released to the public, they're in far fewer supply than uh, another prototype. I'll just grab one down here, like um, uh, this happens to be a, a Frogger. Frogger 2, a released game. So there would be, tend to be more of these, uh, of a game that had already been commercially released by Atari or Parker Brothers, than, than one of these. And so I, one of a kind, probably not. Okay. Fewer than 20, likely. How can you tell a prototype from some guy who just put together a label and slapped it on the car? Yeah. How, how, what's a, way, a good way to tell the difference from a legit prototype? I, I, absolutely. I mean, and that's an excellent question because authenticity, these were never designed to be released to the public. Right. And, and, and honestly, uh, there's not much to differentiate what this is to what somebody could produce themselves. Look inside the end of the, the prototype, and I'll look inside this one as well. Can you see all the chips inside there? There's yeah. at least uh, uh, two, three that are visible on this one, and probably the same on yours. Three, yeah. yeah. And, and these are prototype boards. The board itself that holds the chips is shaped like a T, and it was only used for prototype development work. And the chips themselves are EEPROMs erasable chips, not prototype ROM chips. And also, the label on the front. This is a label that we see on Atari 5200 prototypes, and, and yours is similar. Uh, yours has a date on it, and you can see that it does say that it was a uh, prototype lab uh, software department at Atari. So is A&E the title of the game? Or is that just it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, this was A&E, and okay. it was uh, going to be a conversion of a game that would been, I believe it was previously on the Atari 8-bit, wasn't it? Okay, and yeah. they always showed up on Coleco okay. as well. Cool. And Track and Field was a game that they were developing uh, in conjunction for the 1984 Summer Olympics. They did release the game for the Atari 2600. Atari was a sponsor of that Olympic event. Okay. And I'm sure that uh, this Track and Field was intended to be released in conjunction with the Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it never was. Cool. Yeah, so those are kind of fun, aren't they? You know, the values on these things, John, they do kind of uh, range in certain prices. They may not be as expensive as you may think. Um, uh, these prototypes are in the, let's say, $150 to $200 price range. Again, they were never released commercially, so it represents the only opportunity to maybe play this game in its original format. And, and they can sell for quite a bit less than that, even down into maybe the $50, $75 price range. Are these originally, they came from someone who had worked at Atari then? Is it kind of how they come out to the public? Yeah. Someone works there and yeah. give it to a friend who sells it? Or? It would be interesting to know. And I know that some of the programmers have talked about having these in their personal possession and handing them around to friends or associates. And, and some of the games uh, that were released were also distributed to, uh, it could be to electronic game magazines, pre-release copies that would have been handed out to industry people so that they could write their previews of the games for the forthcoming release. So some of them made it out in that regard. A lot of them were personal property of the people that worked at Atari, and the only way they exist today was because those people sold them eventually. Or hmm. it's that's one of the rarities. The rarity is the fact that it wasn't intended to leave Atari necessarily. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I thought that was an interesting. That's very cool. An unusual item to see, and it, I think if you're a collector of Atari 5200, uh, the prototypes add uh, a level of complexity to your collection, kind of elevate it above just acquiring one of each of the released games. I mean, here you can get something that a lot of people may not have. Mm -hmm. That's why prototypes are exciting. Okay, cool. I have something else to show you. Okay, what else you got? Well, uh, I know that you're a fan of the Vectrix. Yes. I, I think everybody that likes uh, classic video games does appreciate the Vectrix, and I have something here I wanted to show you. And, and just so people know, this is the Vectrix box Vectrix in front of me. So we do have one. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, the Vectrix. Uh, Vectrix was released in 83, and it has a built-in monitor which uh, plays vector-type uh, video games. 
And what I brought in today to show you is the rarest released game for the Vectrix. Here you go. I was so this game, <laughs> yeah, well, this game is, uh, this is just the cartridge uh, for the game, and you can see on the front of the label that it says Mr. Boston, and above the game, a uh, name Clean Sweep. Mr. Boston is a game that was uh, a promotional cartridge. It was available through the, I believe it was through the purchase of Mr. Boston Liquors. They're a liquor uh, company, uh, bourbons and whis whiskeys and things of this sort. And they had a promotional campaign, and part of the campaign, or some of the promotion was that they were get a Vectrix game through purchasing some of their liquors. I'm not exactly sure how it all came to be. It, today, this game is far and away the most rarest game for the Vectrix system. Population count on these, a, a cartridge, this is about one of maybe six that exist in the world today. And uh, they also are, a couple of them are known with the original box, and uh, maybe two of those exist in the world today. So we're talking extreme rarity. Um, it came with an overlay and everything in there. It did. It came with a box, and, uh, which was unique. It also had Mr. Box, Boston on the box, uh, on the overlay, and on the game cartridge. Hmm. The game itself is a Clean Sweep, which is a common game yeah. and, uh, for Vectrix. It's a graphics hack. The graphics of uh, clean, clean Sweep have been modified slightly. Um, and there's a startup screen, which welcomes you from, to purchase products from Mr. Boston. What kind of estimated value would you say uh, a cart like this with, with one six? The world. What, what kind of buy? What would someone pay uh, for something like that? And it's an excellent question. You know, I I, I don't like to use the phrase um, uh, the the price is what somebody is willing to pay for it. But when you're dealing with something that's uh, as rare as this, you really have to go based upon um, what somebody would be willing to pay for it. Although in my experience, I would say that a game in this cartridge right here should sell for a thousand dollars, and I think that that's justifiable. Based on its extreme rarity and the popularity of the Vectrix system in general, so I think that that's a thousand dollar video game right there. That's cool. Yeah, and a top shelf item for any Vectrix collector. Yeah, people. and it's actually a really good, good shape. It's an excellent it's shape, shape really too. Shape. It doesn't, look like, it doesn't look like it was uh, maybe made yesterday. It has no, I uh, know, no wear on the label. I don't see. It says right here on the label, Mr. Boston's uh, Schnapps. Hundred proof. Yeah, uh, uh, they, they, sixty hundred yeah. proof. When you insert the game cartridge, it does come up with a list of the products. It's about four or five different types of liquors that they. Have. Cool. I don't know. They, maybe they're still in business today. Have you ever had? You a, know have you ever sampled Mr. Boston's products? I, I haven't. Maybe Scotch. I, I want to say in the Midwest, I've seen a Mr. Boston's liquor store, but I might be wrong. Maybe <laughs> somewhere in like in uh, in central central Missouri. But I don't know, maybe I could even talk. I, we'd have to have somebody write in, I guess, after the show and tell you some more about it. Leave a comment below, guys. Let us know if you guys have ever had Mr. Boston's. Maybe they're drinking a Mr. Boston's liquor. Well, they're, <laughs> well, they're now they're having their going for another one right now. <laughs> right on. Very cool. What else you got, Joe? Well, um, there was uh, something else I wanted to show you, which would be, well, it's another Atari item. Um, now, if I was to hand this to you, it doesn't look exceptional, does it? It's um, pretty it's, plain, uh, pretty boring. It's an Atari 2600 game, we can tell that by looking at it. Yeah. It doesn't have any labels or identification on it. Maybe it's something that if you saw it at a swap meet, you'd probably just pass it by and go for something else. But actually, this is really a special item. Uh, even though it doesn't have any labeling, what this is is an Atari 2600 uh, Pepsi Invaders. Hmm. I've heard of this before. It is. It's, um, it's a game that was produced by Atari uh, under contract to Coca-Cola. And the use of the game, it was given away as a promotional item at a convention in Atlanta, Georgia in 1983 okay. to people that attended the, Coca-Cola employees that attended the convention. Uh, the production on the game, I, I don't know, but I'm sure it was probably limited to uh, a few hundred people, maybe a thousand. You figure a large attendance at the conference, maybe it draws a thousand people. I'm not sure if it was given away as an award or what, but in today's marketplace, um, a Pepsi Invaders cartridge is um, a little bit less than a thousand dollars. They do trade hands occasionally, and they usually sell between eight fifty to a thousand and fifty. So nine fifty would be a good center point. Okay. This one, I would say, is in excellent condition. Uh, I, I have seen some other ones that have some uh, wear on the uh, case itself. Um, there was a box that was also uh, given away with the cartridge. This one is just the cartridge itself. Hmm. And I thought you had an interesting question about this earlier um, before we started recording, which was. Well, how do you know that it's real, right? right. How do you authenticate yeah, something yeah. like this? Because it just looks like an Atari cartridge that you've taken the labels right. off of. Right. And um, the answer to that is you have to open the cartridge case and look at the chip 
and the circuit board on the inside, and there's some indicators in there. I won't get into the details that allow you to authenticate that okay. it's a real, it's the real deal. Legit, yeah, because when, you, when uh, you're dropping that much money, you just want to make sure you're careful about. You're right. You know, spending close to a thousand dollars on, uh, you know, a fake copy. I'm sure that happens. It, it, it's true, and it bothers me because I have seen uh, fakes of these uh, being misrepresented and selling for what I would consider to be, uh, you know, it's too much money, and it's 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 an easy game to to uh, perpetrate a fraud on somebody that may not be as knowledgeable as they should be. Mm -hmm. So education, and, and you really have to educate yourself when you're going to buy something like um, like this Pepsi Invaders. Cool. This one actually did uh, it came from out of uh, Georgia. If you recall, the seller um, found it, and it makes sense that attendees Based would be in the Atlanta area. And uh, it seems like most of Pepsi Invaders are discovered in the Atlanta, Georgia area. It, it's interesting that they don't have a label. I wonder no, if part of the reason is because of copyright, they can't use the word Pepsi. Well, they have Pepsi in the game, so I don't know how they it's copyright reasons why they wouldn't be able to. The other thing which is interesting about it is um, it's a hack of Space Invaders, so the graphics in Space Invaders have been changed to uh, show the word Pepsi, but it was actually manufactured by Atari. It was coded uh, by a programmer at Atari, so unlike a, a game that had been coded by somebody outside of Atari, this is obviously a case of where Atari was contracted by Coca-Cola to develop a game for them. They burned it onto a ROM, and it's an Atari uh, product. It's a released product. Cool. Yeah. That's very cool. But you know, we talked about video games. We've gone over the 5200 and then we've the Vectrix, and that was the Atari 2600. Yeah. But rarities can all, and collecting video games can be other things. And I mean, when you think about other products that were produced during the height of the video game popularity in the early 80s, we know they did frisbees and t shirts, and we've seen uh, Post memorabilia. Yeah. Yeah. But here's probably something that you haven't seen before. Oh, wow, look at this. Yeah. This is something that you probably are maybe even familiar, maybe one of your favorites growing up Absolutely. as a kid. Super Sugar Crisp cereal. Okay, that uh, doesn't look too unusual. Now, before you continue, Joe, I, I gotta point out. Yes, go right ahead. Okay, this is an unopened box of cereal. So it's 83. Okay, but there's still cereal in the I, box. I, yeah, this sounds fresh. Let's doesn't go. I'm it? sure this preserved is. I'm sure it's still be good. Let's, <laughs> let's pop it open. And let's fist up a bowl. You take the first bite. <laughs> That's I know. cool. That's cool. It is. And I mean, it's a it's a 30-year-old uh, box of cereal, which is unusual. But the reason that it becomes a video game collectible is if and it's a little bit visible on the front of the box. I think down here, you know, maybe not as, as relevant. But let's turn it over to the back of the box. Here you go. On the back of this box, we can see that in 1983, there was a um, uh, promotional item here, which was a free ColecoVision system. And it was tied into, that was a grand prize. Or you could win autographed baseball or different playing cards, uh, baseball trading cards. And so uh, what's interesting about something like this is that if you're a ColecoVision collector and you've been collecting for a while and you've tracked down a lot of the original games and you have the system and the controllers and, and you have them on display especially. Let's say you're proud of your collection and you, know, you like the appearance of it, but you've kind of run short of things to add to your collection. Wouldn't this look great for a ColecoVision collector to have something like this on their wall mm -hmm. or next to their collection to add some interest? And, and is it rare? I would say it's rare. I've never seen a 30-year-old well, yeah, box of cereal. It's, it's interesting because you you think that, I mean, you, you expect someone to keep holding onto the box, but certainly to, to buy a cereal back in 1983 and then never open it and then just I, I don't hold know on why. to it. Like you said before, we were talking kind of off camera, and it seems kind of interesting. So, like you said, how often mm. do you come across a an unopened box of su uh, Super Sugar Crisp, which I think is still around. I think it's I think Golden it, Puffs or so Golden Grams, or Golden Grams maybe? Uh, not Golden uh, Grams. Golden Grams are flat. This is yeah. the uh, puffed rice. Uh, yeah, but I'm pretty thing. sure it's still around, but they, but, they took uh, off the sugar. Yeah, though. I don't think they want to call, it's not called sugar anymore, but uh, it's probably a healthier version of Super Sugar Crisp, but still the same delicious cereal. Yeah. It's, it's a, cool. This, is, this would be categorized, we would call this obviously memorabilia. And a lot of times the memorabilia, like this box of cereal, are things that were never intended to be saved. I mean, yeah. it's obvious that this was something that was intended to be used, and uh, uh, there's other examples of things that were really, it's just amazing that they survived to this day, because they were never intended to be put aside. Like a video game would be something you would expect somebody to hold on to for a while, but a box of cereal? Huh. No. What do you think of value of something like this is? Do you have any, any idea? <laughs> it's a really difficult thing. I think it, um, you have to find somebody that, um, would appreciate having it. The condition on it is excellent. It's difficult to find a comparison to um, other boxes of cereal that may have famous uh, uh, baseball players and stuff on this front. 
they sell for thirty to maybe fifty dollars. I'm thinking that this box of cereal is because it's even rarer than some of those box games. Some of the cereal boxes were bought and held for yeah. posterity because the front of the box had Troy Aikman on it. Right, right. This is really an esoteric one. I'm thinking this one's probably closer to seventy-five to even a hundred dollars for this box of cereal. Wow. Yep. Cool. And it, it, the front of the box is, has the information as well about the ColecoVision. The other thing which is unusual is ColecoVision was really only in the marketplace starting in 83 when video games of popularity started to fall anyway. You see a lot more Atari and television memorabilia, Nintendo memorabilia. ColecoVision memorabilia, things that are not directly related to the video game system, is really kind of hard to track down. There isn't a lot of things that were out there in the marketplace related to ColecoVision. This is really one of just a few items if you're a ColecoVision collector that you can add to your collection and have some memorabilia. This is during the video game crash, though, right? 83 was kind of around when it was starting to crash, right? It was. So this was kind of maybe right before the, the big... It was right there the at the crash. edge of yeah, it. Yeah. It, was, it was right there at the edge of it, you know. I, I, because it's a baseball promotion, I'm guessing, wouldn't you think it would probably be spring, summer of 83? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, in 1983, most of the video game companies were losing money yeah. hand over fist. And uh, a lot of the game companies, some of the game companies that we know real well, like Magic. Uh, they went out of business in 83. By the end of the year, they were already bankrupt. And uh, some of the early Atari companies had already gone bankrupt by 80, the end of 82. So yeah, 83, mm -hmm. and then particularly as we entered into 84, it was a really great video game crash. You know, it's almost too bad that they didn't have an exclusive baseball game that had like the Super Sugar Crisp logo on it, because then that would be another... Oh, it would be another right? promotional be... tie? It makes sense. <laughs> and we, we see that with, we've seen that with like um, Chase the Chuck Wagon yeah, with yeah. Uh, Atari 2600, where you have yeah, a, a promotional cool. item that was... In the, <laughs> yeah. I know. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Joe. I really appreciate it. You can definitely find more of this great stuff to purchase, and that's at Atari2600.com. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Joe.